Please turn with me to Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. To the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And that is the reading of God's word. Our speaker today is a senior pastor, and I'll invite him to come. And then we will pray. We will pray for him. And he's sitting down because of his knee. <laughs> it's not new style for the year. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Uh, our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for uh, your word this morning. We want to thank you because your word brings life and light into our lives. And so we open up our hearts and our minds to receive that which you have for us today. We pray for uh, Pastor JP as he breaks down your word to us, that, Lord, you will use him as your mouthpiece, that he shall speak the word of God with power and boldness, and that, Lord, um, you will minister to him as he ministers uh, to us on your behalf. Mm. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. Let's appreciate Njambi. You have led us so well, so well. Happy New Year. Please tell somebody, don't get tired. We'll say Happy New Year until Valentine's Day. <laughs> then after that, the New Year started. So, Happy New Year. Uh, as Njambi mentioned, yes, I'm sitting down. My, my knee is getting better. Um, we thank God for that. I had an injury that flared up an old injury, but now we are doing much, much, much better. Thank you for that. Our apologies to our online community. I've just been informed that our camera has developed some problems. So we will record the sermon and upload it later. Uh, hopefully they will get that message that uh, we are working to make sure all things work. As we begin the new year, you walked in. Did you see the banner for the new year? What does it say? Drive, flourish, prosper. Okay? Drive, flourish, prosper. And just because you may forget, we put take your position as you come up as you go down the stairs, okay? Because we are saying you have taken your position, but now we want you to thrive in that position, okay? Driving denotes an intentionality, an act of the will. I want to do well in the areas that I'm taking my positions, especially in my walk with the Lord. Then as you do that, the result will be you will flourish in your walk with the Lord, in your relationships, in your marriage, that is our prayer. As you thrive, you will flourish. And then the fruit of that will be to prosper. And so that is the theme for the year for us as we continue. Uh, from John 10.10, 10, that the Lord Jesus Christ came, that you may have life and have it in abundance. Amen? So we are very excited about this theme. And just an update on Shalash. Thank you so much for your continued giving. We are at 80% 
Let's give Jesus a clap. That's uh, fantastic. And uh, Pastor Harun is already down there. He traveled on Friday. He is very excited. He wants to begin to build those relationships with the communities down there. So what is remaining is just a few things. We are still missing the beds, the three beds, and the mattresses. So Pastor Harun will be there, but he doesn't have a bed. So please, let's continue to pray about this, trusting that we'll get the beds and the mattresses. Uh, we also need uh, tea and some cutleries and a few things for the toilet. And then we have scheduled February the 8th to the 10th of uh, this coming month in February that we will take all these things down to uh, Lamu in Shalash. And hopefully one of the days there, we will also visit the aware community there. So if you want to join us during that uh, mission to go and take all that has been collected, it's 8th uh, to 10th of February. You can fly down, you can drive down, but we hope when we are we are there, we'll continue to share the love of Christ with the community at Lamu and Shalash. So we are 80% trusting God that we will have completed the remaining things, the beds, the mattresses, the cutlery as we go on. Praise the Lord. Yes, so that's the update for Shalash. Thank you for your giving. It has been overwhelming and we are very, very blessed. So now we continue with our theme for this month. The seven churches of Revelation, hear what the Lord is saying. Hear what the Lord is saying. The seven churches. And a little background here. I know we did some introduction um, last week and Pastor Eric did a wonderful job. Is some things that we'll really appreciate why this book is such an important book um, for the church. And actually it's some denominations don't read this book. Did you know that? Ah, we will not go there. But the background here is that these seven churches um, are during the reign of Emperor Domitian, who was the emperor of the Roman Empire, AD 81 to 96. Okay? And he has come in uh, and he has, it's like he has started the second persecution of believers across his empire. And before that, anything that wrong could happen in the empire, the Christians were to be blamed. If there was famine, it is the Christians. You know? If it was fires, it was the Christians. So they were the scapegoat. And they really suffered. Okay? And so Emperor Domitian comes in and he begins and he takes emperor worship to the next level. You know, he, he builds a temple to worship him in many of the major cities. And in this church that we're looking at in Ephesus, he has built a very high temple where you have to worship him for you to be able to trade and to do all those things. So you can imagine for you as a believer, you're not doing all these things. You are shunned. You're looked down upon. And in fact, it is said during the, the reign of this Emperor Domitian, if you're a Christian and you were arrested, okay, this is what they used to say. One, if you denounce then you could be found not guilty, even if you're not guilty. But you have to denounce Christianity, okay? But even if you denounce, it is not 100% sure that you will be forgiven, okay? And many, many believers died during this reign, okay? And so this is the background of these guys receiving a letter from John who is saying it is from Jesus Christ. So I don't believe it would have been a letter to confuse them. It would not have been a letter to cause them more drama as they are thinking. This is, they are persecuted. Okay? So as they receive this word, it must have been a book of hope and encouragement for them at this particular moment. Um, and so that is where we are. And so we will recap what we did uh, last week. Uh, and we said that Revelation is a book about the future and about the present. Praise be to God. Okay? That's what we are saying. So it's not just, some people look at Revelation, they think it's just for the future. It has got nothing to do with now or for the people who are reading back then. But it is a book about the future and about the present. Why? Because it is a book that gives hope to all believers for the future. Praise be to God. As you read Revelation, there is hope for the future. Praise be to God. It doesn't matter what is going on 
at the present, there is hope. Okay? And where does this hope come from? From the second thing. Because this book proclaims Christ's final victory over evil. Praise be to God. Final victory over evil. Actually, the basic theme of Revelation is that in the end, Jesus wins. So as a persecuted church, as they're seated there, as they read this, this is the end. Jesus wins. And we can proclaim like the revelator, Amen, come Lord Jesus. Amen, come Lord Jesus. You see, we just celebrated Christmas. And Jesus' first coming, he came as a humble, suffering servant. But he will return as a powerful, conquering king. And all who love him will rejoice. But his enemies will be filled with fear. Okay? So it proclaims Christ's final victory over evil. What began in Genesis chapter 3, and the enemy thought he has won, in the end, Jesus wins. But also, Revelation gives us a present guidance to how to live for Jesus today. Praise be to God. How are you to live for Jesus today? You can get some wonderful guidance for that. And so, Pastor Eric reminded us that revelation is on the basis of the work of Christ. This hope is on the basis of the work of Christ. And this hope is to be heeded in the power of Jesus Christ. Amen? That is the background, the introduction to what we did last week for those who were not there. And so today, as we go to chapter 2, in chapter 1, as John was introducing this letter, he is very clear. This is not an apostle of John to the church. He actually says this is a revelation from Jesus Christ himself. The one you've been holding on to when you're being persecuted. Now he is speaking to you in that particular circumstance. And he goes on to verse 4 where we were reading during communion just to again describe himself. And then the vision of Christ and how he is robed in majesty and power. It was a wonderful, vivid picture of Jesus Christ. And so as we come to chapter 2, to the church in Ephesus, okay? Now, John is writing, he is exiled in Patmos, and his crime was because he was a practicing Christian. The question we need to ask ourselves, why these seven churches? Were these the only churches during this period? No, they were not. Okay? Can you mention any other churches that you think were there from the books of the Bible? Corinthians, Corinthians the church at Corinth. It was a big church. Galatia was another church. Even Jerusalem, they, it wasn't mentioned. So why these seven churches? Why these seven churches? Okay? First of all, we need to appreciate that they were real churches. Not just a figment of imagination or a place that was not there. These churches were there. And those who had the privilege of going to modern day Turkey, like Reverend Phoebe, will attest to that. You know, that, yes, the, the, the ruins are there. Uh, and now Turkey is predominantly Muslim, but these churches existed. Okay? The church in Ephesus, as we continue, we'll see the church in Minor. Pagamom, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And so these were real churches, okay? And some have also argued that these churches represent successive periods in the history of the church. So for example, the church in Ephesus, they have argued, uh, theologians, that this represents the early church from the resurrection of Jesus to the end of the apostles' age, okay? Then you go to the next church, which represents maybe the early fathers, and so on and so forth and so forth, okay? But for me, why these seven? Because these messages to these seven churches, though tailored to the named churches, their stated spiritual condition can symbolize all churches in one respect or another across time. The spiritual conditions of these churches can symbolize all churches in one respect or another, including KCC in 2023. Okay? So how can we apply these letters? Number one, as a condition of any church, any time, 
these messages to the churches are like a triage. We are taking your vitals as a church. How are you doing? What is the condition of KCC currently? Which of these letters closely resemble the church that meets here locally or the church in Kenya? Okay? So as a condition of any church at any time, this is a wonderful measure, an evaluation of how we are doing in this area. Okay? But remember, it is not the walls. It is the people. Okay? And I have to put a disclaimer here because sometimes when we look at churches with human uh, perspective, we may see a church that has got a multitude. It is thriving. The lights, the music, and everything. And we may think in our minds, whoa, this is where Jesus lives. But Jesus would look at that church and perhaps say, they need help. And we may look at another church that is really struggling in our neighborhoods. We, in fact, think they are making noise. There are only five or six. And we think this, this church does not have any fruit. It's not successful. And Jesus may be saying, these guys have found the secret. And they know what is going on. And so as we evaluate, we need to keep in perspective, it is what God says and not human perspective. We are prone, like Samuel with the sons of Jesse, when he was looking, who is the next king, to look at the outward and begin to think we are not doing well. Okay? So, we can apply this as a condition of any church at any time. Uh, the second part is we can view this as periods in church history. Uh, and the third one is as an exhortation to individual lives for you and I today. Okay? And I hope this is where we will dwell more today as an exhortation to us as a church. So, let's go to chapter 2 and continue from there. To the angel of the church in Ephesus. Okay? Right. Now, that, that word there, the angel, sometimes it has been translated to the messenger. Uh, others have even said, it's like the pastor will be reading that letter to the church in Ephesus, the, 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 the messenger. And he says, read these words. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Praise be to God. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Now, when you go to the end of chapter 1, we are told what exactly these are. Okay, The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the, of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So what is Jesus saying in verse 1? He is describing himself from the onset. And to each church he describes himself. And what does he say? I hold you in my hands. Praise be to Jesus. We belong to him. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Right hand denotes the power of God. And here he paints a picture of possession. So these seven stars, these seven golden lampstands are the seven churches. And he's saying it is a reminder to whom they belong. The one who holds us in his hands. Praise be to God. You belong to Jesus Christ. As a church, you belong to him. Okay? And there are so many verses that we can go to that remind us of this truth. Okay? When you go to Isaiah 43 and verse 1. Fear not. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are. Okay, say that like you mean it. Fear not, I have redeemed you, I have called you by name. You are mine. You belong to him. 1 Corinthians 7.23, you have been bought and paid for by Christ. So you belong to who? To him. And this is a reminder to the churches that we belong to him. And in John chapter 10 verse 28, those who belong to him, no one can pluck them from his hand. Praise be to God. This is a wonderful encouragement. So if you are a persecuted church at that time and this is the message that begins that you belong to him, you begin to say yes. Yes and amen. Okay? Doesn't this change your perspective that you belong to Jesus? That the church of Christ, you and I, belong to him. We may face persecution. We may face rejection. But we belong to him. Who is and was and is to come? Who is the Alpha and Omega? The beginning and the end. We belong to him. And listen to how it continues in verse B of that verse. 
and he walks among the seven golden lampstands. Okay? Jesus is in the midst of these churches. After he resurrected, did not just leave us to our own devices. He walks in our midst. Praise be to God. What a wonderful thing to be reminded of. Jesus is in our midst. We forget that often. And so as we gather every morning to worship him, it, it, it slowly becomes about us. It is not about meeting Jesus who is in our midst. It is about this and that. Whispering to your wife, what is for lunch? <laughs> you know? We forget Jesus is in our midst. You know? We have even had people say, oh, I will come to church to see so and so. Church has become a place for us to come and see one another. And that's a bonus. You know? Jesus is in our midst. How would it change your worship if you knew Jesus was seated here today? Would you lift your voice higher as you're singing? What a beautiful name. Especially looking at him. <laughs> it doesn't need to change. He is in our midst. And so for the church in Ephesus, he's telling them, he holds you in his hand, but also he is in your midst. Praise be to God that our Savior is in our midst. It is not in vain to gather every Sunday to wash. He is in our midst. Praise be to God. And so, though Jesus, though we belong to Jesus, he doesn't demand it from us. He will allow you to run after the things of this world and the selfishness of life. But what happens? The more we run after those things, we become more miserable. We may look at the people out there and think they're living such wonderful lives. But I, I am so convinced that the world is becoming more miserable without Jesus Christ. They have even said now there are no binaries, you know. Now for those who don't know, <laughs> no binaries, male or female, right? So you can choose whatever binary you are, the ones or the zeros, okay? But what has happened? When you read the stories of people allowing their children to choose their genders over years, these children end up with depression. Suicide rates go higher. The things that we thought bring joy are making us more miserable. That's what Jesus does. He allows you to make a decision. I belong to you, God, then I want to be with you. And I hope for you, as you choose to thrive this year, you will choose to belong and be with him who holds you in his hand. Okay? So we don't come to church because of many other things, but our, our Savior is there. We are there to meet with him, commune with him, together with the others, as we exhort his holy name. Then we continue. Now, Jesus is continuing to speak, and he says, verse 2, I know your deeds, the church of Ephesus, your hard work, and your perseverance. Praise be to God. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing if Jesus stands here and he says, Jambi, I know your hard work and I know your perseverance. That is a wonderful, wonderful commendation. So the church in Ephesus was really working for Christ. They were really serving him and giving him his all. Another translation says hard work, it's working yourself onto exhaustion. When you go to sleep, you are spent for Jesus. That was the church of Ephesus. They were serving the Lord completely with abandon. And they persevered. Though the persecutions were going on, they were persevering. They were serving the Lord. Ephesus was really doing it for the Lord. Would you say KCC is like this? We have completely served the Lord with abandon. To some extent, I think so. We, we, have, we, we serve the Lord. We give our all for those who are excited to serve the Lord. And you keep on giving and serving and loving him and perseverance. Okay? And we are told what else they did apart from serving the Lord with abandon. And I have to say this. There's no, nothing much more joyful than giving your all to serve the Lord. To serve the Lord. And so in verse B of that, he continues to say, so the first commendation is, I know your works, I know your hard work and your perseverance, I know you cannot tolerate wicked people. 
ask your neighbor, do you tolerate wicked people? Did you vote for them? <laughs> did, did you vote for wicked people? No. We, we don't know who is wicked. But anyway. This church did not tolerate wicked people or sinful people. They called out sin. They called out sin. And in fact, they interrogated the men and women of, who, who said they are men and women of God. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. I am, I'm very grateful for the pulpit team here at Caring Community Church because it's made up of people who love the Lord, sound doctrine, and we keep each other in check. And so we will not just allow anybody to come and use our pulpit to share God's word. That needs to be the norm, even for you. What are you listening to? And I remember we were having this conversation with uh, Pastor Emma when a certain Pastor Ezekiel was in uh, Kasarani. And people were saying, no, 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 don't ask what he was teaching. Ask how many people were there. God was moving. <laughs> so there are people telling us, don't, don't ask questions. The result is what matters, right? But we need to ask what was he teaching. And then you hear, he's selling water, anointed water, and all these other things. And it shocked me. He hardly even goes to the scripture or to teach God's word. But he's a man of God, as the world puts it. His numbers are there. And so this person was telling Pastor Emma, the reason why we don't come to you because you guys don't have the resorts. We are going where there are resorts. <laughs> People are being healed. People are being resurrected. Well, I'm sorry. For, for current community church, we... Not that we don't see the miraculous of the Lord, but for us, our joy is right there. To impact the world through world prayer care. To know, love, and present Christ as Lord. That is who God has called us to be. So the church in Ephesus, this for them was important. Not just anybody would come and speak to them. They would interrogate and they would not tolerate wickedness. The Church of England has just ordained their first non-binary vicar. So this vicar is saying, I'm not male, I'm not female. That's, that's the world that we are living in. Will we tolerate this sinful nature? Now, not tolerating wicked people is not cruelty. It is not looking down. It's not condemning. It's not an angry attitude. I like what Pastor... Paul of Calvary Chapel says about it, he says, it is holding the line of truth as it relates to behavior and how people live their lives. It's holding the line. Holding the line. And saying, you know, that is not something I believe in. That is not, you know, I love you, but that is not what God says in his word. And they will ask you. They will ask you, and they will call you names, homophobe and all that, but remember, this church in Ephesus, they did not care about all those things. They chose not to tolerate wickedness. Okay? The opportunity to hold the line. Hold the line of truth as it relates to behavior. It breaks my heart. You love the Lord, but you are indulging in alcohol and all those things, and you come to his house. We need to be able to tell you that is not good living. That is not right. Well, if you take away your tithe, and some people are afraid to say that, but we need to be able to call sin, sin. Praise be to God. We, we, we don't have two ways about it. Sin is sin. Okay? So God loves you, but if you're indulging in sin, we say that is not right. Live according to that. So the church in Ephesus did not tolerate wicked people or sin. Okay? And as you hold that line, verse 3 will tell you, you have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. Prepare for persecutions and hardships as you hold to that line. The truth of who God is. Okay. Persevere. Speak the truth in love. But even then, be ready that you will be persecuted. People will call you names, but do not grow weary like the church in Ephesus. Okay. So wonderful things have been said about Ephesus. Number one, they 
They work hard, right? They really work hard for the Lord. Ask, ask your neighbor. <laughs> How are you working for the Lord? How are you working for the Lord? I know you're working very hard for yourself and your company and your career and your business, but for the Lord, how are you working hard for him? Okay. Number two. Okay. This is a church that persevered, right? Number three, they did not tolerate wickedness or sin. Okay. And they endured hardships for the name of the Lord. Then verse four. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. What? But God, we are serving you so hard at work. We are persevering. We don't tolerate wicked people. Can't you see how much we are? He says, but I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Wow. You have forsaken. Now the word used there, forsaken, is not lost. Okay? John did not say, Jesus did not say, yet I hold this against you. You have lost the love that you had for me. You, you know we lose things, right? How many of you lose things? I recently had a conversation with my wife. We were somewhere. I, I lost my phone and I'm telling her, this phone, I gave it to you. She's saying, you didn't give me the phone. I said, I gave you the phone. Now it has been stolen, you know. So I had made my peace. Then I go to the car, and what do I see? <laughs> she gave me a very spiritual look. <laughs> we, we lose things, right? These guys did not lose. Forsaken is an act of will. They deliberately left their first love. Haven't we seen this in the house of the Lord? We can be serving the Lord, but our motives are not right. Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter about love, you know, we talk about love. And he says many things. You can speak in tongues, you can give to the need, even give your body, but if it is done without love, it is noise, clanging symbols. What are the motives as you serve the Lord? Some of us could be, for the Ephesians, perhaps they served. They began serving the Lord, but along the way, they forsook this first love. My goodness. My question for all of us today, have you left this first love? Do you remember when you gave your life to the Lord? No prayer meeting would be called that you would not be there. Bible study, in fact, you were looking for them. For many of us, when we were young people, we spent more time after high school in churches than at home. We were on fire for Jesus. What happened to that love? This is a question I ask myself, that now when we call you for prayer, pastor, you know, you know, when we call you for Bible study, the love is not there. And you will say, of course, I love him. But what happened to those things when we call to going out to share Christ? that one is for the missions. <laughs> I will pray for them. But when you just came to the Lord, a crusade or whatever, you would be there. You knock at doors, they chase you, you come back. What happened to that first love? I wish I could shake all of you and ask you, what happened to that first love? And Jesus is saying, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love that you had at first for me. You can give and we praise the Lord for that. But what happened to that love? That anything that has to do with the things of God, you are there, you are burning with fire. But it is not in vain. Verse 5, Jesus tells us what to do. When we evaluate and see that we have forsaken this love at first. And he says, number one, consider how far you have fallen. Consider how far you have fallen. Okay? So remember. Remember where you were. Remember how you were on fire for Jesus. Joy, that ground zero. You were fired up. All the young people. And now they don't see them. What happened to that first love? And many of us. But remember. Remember where you were. Remember that first love. Consider where you have fallen from. Then as you remember, what do you do? 
repent. This is a biblical word that simply means turn around and change. And it's there in verse 5. Repent and do the things you did at first. It's not nuclear physics. (laughs) Just do the things that you did at first. You enjoyed being in the presence of the Lord. You would move mountains to be in the presence of the Lord. Nothing would stop you from being with the Lord. Jesus longs for a relationship more than the things we do for him. Okay? And then after that, what do you need to do? Then return. So repent, change. This is how you've been living in 2022. As we choose to thrive, flourish, and prosper, just return to those things. Ask the Lord to guide and lead you back to those things. Okay, and he says, I will come to you. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. And lampstand is that aspect of being church. Maybe this is what happened to those churches in Turkey. We are not sure. So friends, I just want you to think about that. How are you doing when it comes to that first love with the Lord? You need to remember to repent and to return. But Jesus continues, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Nicolaitans was a sect, a cult among the Greeks who said the body is nothing. The soul is what matters. You can do with your body whatever you want as long as you keep the soul pure. And so in Ephesus, they had these temples to Artemis and they had prostitutes, both male and female. And you can go and use your body no matter how you want to use it. Your soul is okay. You love the Lord. The Ephesians hated that. And Jesus says, I also hate that. You cannot use your body for the things of this world and still hold on to this truth that, oh, I love the Lord. He is good and the Nicolaitans. This is what they believed. Then verse 7. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hear what the Lord is saying. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Paradise of God. Do you know paradise means a garden? Paradiso. So what would happen is that emperors would host lavish garden parties for their visitors in their paradiso. And everybody looked forward to that. But Christians would never dream of being there because they were not welcomed. But they are told, you guys, you will be in my paradise. You will enjoy. What you have not enjoyed in this world, you just hold on and see. To the one who is victorious. In Ephesus, they had this big tree outside the marketplace or near the, the temple of Artemis. It was so big, people would go and touch that tree and, and, and receive life and receive good things from their gods. And so Jude is telling them, now you guys will actually have the right to eat from the tree of life. The tree of life. Okay. So serving the Lord for the wrong motive, we should not treat church as a duty, like a habit, like a project. Jesus longs for relationship, not just behavior or duty. Okay? Jesus is saying to all of us today, stay faithful. I have a better reward for you. Better than anything this world could offer. Tell your neighbor, stay faithful. Stay faithful. I have a better, better reward for you than anything that you could ever give. Let's take some time to pray over these things and meditate over them this coming week as we evaluate where we are. My Jesus, I love thee. I know Thou art mine For thee All the follies Of sin I resign 
my great shall redeem my savior at the As far love at me and purchase my power on Calvary Street. I love thee for. In my shores of glory and blessed love, I'll ever adore Thee in heaven so bright. I will sing, I sing with a glittering ring crown of my brow. If ever I love my Jesus. Just go ahead and speak to him and just declare this is your song. That you would choose to declare how much you love him. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you first loved us. And God, often we are prone to wander, prone to leave the one that we love. Oh God, he is our heart. Take it and seal it for their courts above. Lord, I pray that we will remember where we have been with you, the heights of loving you, the heights of just spending time and just enjoying being in your presence. Oh God, we remember those days and we weep because Lord, slowly we have forsaken this first love. 
Oh God, we pray you will remind us where we have fallen from. We repent, oh Lord, and desire and desire and choose to turn back and live and love you and proclaim how much we love you, oh Lord. Oh, we pray that God will return to those things. In 2023, we will thrive in our relationship with you, oh God. We will desire you more than any other thing in this world. Oh God, help us. It is only by you, God, we can do this. That even for this church in Ephesus that did so well, they had forsaken their first love. Lord, may this not be how KCC is defined, that we are doing so well for you, yet we have forsaken our love for you. May we love you, Lord. May we live for you. May those of us who have been struggling and not having a thriving relationship with you just grasp this truth and live for it. Live for this truth. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you promise us that, Lord, you will hear our prayers. So we want to listen to you, oh God. We want to hear what you're saying, oh God. This, oh Lord, thank you for this privilege to just love you, Lord. And thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your masses that are new every morning. Thank you that, Lord, you cleanse us and clean us from all unrighteousness. This year, Lord, I pray in our families, in our individual lives, God, this love for you will be so real. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege. And for those who don't know you, oh Lord, they will choose to make this step and enjoy this relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It just so happens that uh, tomorrow we begin some time of prayer and fasting. And this is a wonderful discipline. We are not fasting that we may be loved. We are already loved. And so as we fast, as we take time to pray and fast, we want to remind ourselves and draw ever closer to God and say there are things of this world that we choose to set aside to spend time with you. So if you have not gotten this booklet, we will send it uh, on soft copy. But every lunchtime from Tuesday, we will have online prayers. So join us wherever you are. Let's pray together. Let's spend time to remind ourselves of where we have been with the Lord and just spend time in that prayer and fasting. So it's from 5 to 5. We're just skipping lunch and breakfast. If your medication, that is okay. You can join us in prayer. Um, but we just want to spend time and just do those things that we first did as we chose to love the Lord and know him for who he is. And that's why it coincides with us beginning our time of prayer and fasting. And I pray and I believe as we spend time in prayer, this fire in us will be revived. This joy of being in the presence of the Lord will be revived. And 2023 we will thrive, flourish and prosper. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Let me share the words of benediction with us as we come to the end of our service. May our God who called Abraham when he was but one and blessed him and made him many show you the incomparable riches of his grace that you may know you are his workmanship to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.